I'll give her a second to come on in. Yeah, come on in. <laughs> All right, with it, what's that? I don't know, it's probably on the thing. All right, with it being five o'clock, I'm going to call this uh, joint meeting between the school board and city council to order. Uh, this is the one little blurb you're gonna hear from me before I recuse myself, but I'm recusing myself tonight from the meeting, uh, seeing that uh, one of the positions that's potentially being cut on the school board side is a middle school teacher position, and being a middle school teacher here in the city, I think it is important that I sit aside and let the discussion happen without uh, me. As long as that's okay with you all, I'm just gonna sit off to the side and listen in, but not say anything. I gotta try that trick sometimes, sit on the side and not say anything. I'm not sure that I would succeed. That's not that funny, everyone. So, <laughs> we, we might be able to raise money to fill the budget gap, I don't know. Uh, uh, for those that don't know, Dave Witham, uh, city councilor here in the city uh, and deputy mayor, uh, again, Councilor Girding recusing himself from this discussion. So I thought I'd just, uh, Oh, Mayor Girding, yes. I'm still not used to that, so I will get there. Thank you, uh, Councillor Gibson. So, um, this is very informal tonight. Uh, it's conversational in, in nature, uh, but that being said, we are being televised, so we have to add a little formality with this. So, uh, without objection, just if you want to speak, just get recognized, and we'll make sure we get the mic to you so that you can be heard uh, by those that are watching, and just helps with the clarity here. I think that'll be helpful. Um, we didn't do a whole lot of preparation for how this would roll this evening, but we've done this in the past. Uh, I thought it would be helpful if the uh, superintendent uh, would like to get us started with kind of where the school board is, and, and Madam Chair, if you want to jump in, feel free, uh, just in terms of where the school department is in terms of its budget preparation. I know you had a budget workshop this past Saturday morning. Uh, and then after that, I think I'd like to have uh, city staff, uh, probably finance director, deputy city, ma city manager Smith, give us an update on sort of the tax cap, uh, where that stands, uh, and help us out with a general understanding of some other budget numbers that I think would be helpful for the discussion. And then we'll open it up to the group for conversation from there, if that works for everybody. I don't see any objections, so here you go, Lou. And just, how's that sound? Pretty good? Okay, um, we did have a workshop uh, this past Saturday. Uh, we, I think it was about a three hour long workshop and um, we talked about two different budgets, a recommended budget and a tax cap budget. And I'll start with the tax cap budget. And first of all, I wanna say thank you to Bob for squeezing us in tonight. That was, it's greatly appreciated. He's a busy guy and he did a great job of squeezing us in. Um, so I just wanna start off with the tax cap budget based on information we got from the city. Um, the tax cap is, uh, $836,047, and that's based on the CPI, which is 4.1, and uh, that's the only thing that can be considered this year, because I believe you're going through a, a reassessment, correct? I got that right? Yep. And so, um, I wanted to let you know that our projected revenue not raised by property taxes for fiscal year 25 is $10,381,308. That's the revenue side of it. Um, and it's projected that the school district is going to lose $341,128 in state revenue. So that's declining. And it's also projected that uh, the district will lose um, $47,588 in revenue for fiscal year 25. So when you add those two up together, it's $388,716 that we'll lose in revenue. And so, um, when you deduct this loss in revenue, which is, again, 388716 um, the tax uh, cap budget limit amount, uh, you, you take the 836047 minus that 388 and some change in revenue. And that loss of revenue represents 1.9% of the tax cap. Um, the net, essentially what we can expend, is $447,331, which is roughly uh, a 2.2 percent increase for fiscal year 25. So again, I took the four, I took the 447, 331, and divided it by last year's net budget of 20 million, 292,392 dollars. And so we know the CPI is 4.1, um, and this amount, uh, when you look at that total amount, it doesn't fully cover the salary increases for school personnel, as well as the district's contractual obligations such as fixed and operational costs electricity, heat, water, and things like that. So that's the tax cap um, information that I shared with the board on um, 
on uh, Saturday. Um, and then the recommended budget. So the budget process started uh, about a month and a half ago. We've had lengthy discussions with the administrative team, which is composed of all the principals, the facilities director, uh, CTC director, all the lead um, uh, administrative team members were there, and Katie obviously was involved with that. And um, we had some hard, dis you know, conversations around how we're going to, you know, how we, what are we going to do here? And so, what we decided to do is give you a recommended budget. What we feel is recommended to provide um, an adequate public education in summers. So, this budget, the recommended budget, was developed with input from teachers, the building administrators, and central office staff. And so, it was really focused on uh, real student learning. Uh, social, emotional, and physical needs in a post-pandemic world. And I know you hear that a lot, a post-pandemic world, but the pandemic has really impacted public education in many, many different ways. So um, the budget that we're proposing uh, maintains current level of essential programs and services for all students. Uh, it continues to provide um, a level of service that our parents expect and that they're accustomed to uh, in the district and provides an adequate publication, uh, public education in Summersworth. Um, this is the budget that I must recommend to the school committee or the school board, uh, which as the system's leader, and again, input from a variety of different players. And so my job, I've been hired to propose what I think is best for the students uh, in Summersworth. The recommended budget expenditure increase is $1,264,369 above the tax cap. So when you consider that with the 447, 331 associated with the tax cap, that's an increase of uh, $1,264,396 yeah, oh, uh, $264, above the tax cap. So by what that means is that would be an 8.4% increase, okay? So I have a range here t for you to think about. Uh, 2.2, which is the tax cap budget, up to 8.4, which is the recommended budget from a variety, you know, again, from, from the folks that helped me prepare the budget. Um, so how do, how, do, um, how do we get to the tax cap budget? We're going to have to cut $1,264,396. We're going to need to make some cuts. And so the major con consequences of such cuts will be, there'll definitely be personnel cuts, uh, cuts to essential programs and services, and Katie does have a list of, we propose tier one cuts, tier two cuts, and tier three cuts. Uh, higher class sizes for all grades, uh, fewer electives for our high school students. Um, we do anticipate there'll be more referrals for special education and 504 services. Uh, we, we do believe um, there'll be an increased uh, attendance and behavioral problems in the district and decrease in student coverage. Uh, and management abilities because we're cutting staff, we'll have less people around to, to manage those students. And there, there is an, uh, principals are concerned about an increase in student safety concerns and the, the lead administrators and educational leaders in some ways believe uh, that that would result in less than a public, you know, less than an adequate public education in some for, for our children and young adults. And, um, you know, I know we've, we've talked in the past, we cannot, you know, we can do more with less. We can't do that anymore. We cannot do more with less, with less money. Um, and then my final thought I want to share with you, and I'll, I'll pass this out for some of the counselors to take a look at. Uh, you may have seen this before. Um, can you hold that, Maggie, yeah. for a second? Mm -hmm. So there's a researcher by the name of Volmer who looks at what, uh, I, I just need that one of those back I mean just for a second, oh, okay. yeah. Uh, who's looked at what's happened to public education uh, over the years. And he goes back to the 1900s when really public education was focused on lessons in basic hygiene, courses in nutrition, uh, immunizations and screening for vision, hearing, and dental problems. But over the years, and many of you probably were in schools in the 80s and 90s, and as you can see, the list has grown over the, over the decades. And when you look at the 2000s we're in now, it, you know, it, there's a range of things that we're responsible for in public education. And this doesn't even include the things that we're, we're encountering now uh, post-COVID. So I just thought I'd share this with you. It just gives you a perspective of you know, what we're confronted with in public education. Let's see, when I was in school, uh, back in the 70s, there was a focus on special education, drug and alcohol abuse, parenting education, African American studies, women's studies, talented and gifted programs, right down the line. In the 2000s, now we're dealing with bullying prevention uh, programs, 
body, body mass index evaluation, eating disorders, suicide awareness, steroid abuse, um, media literacy training, computers, technology, uh, health and wellness programs, online reading requirements, uh, all kinds of things that didn't exist when I was in school. Of course, I never thought I'd say that when I was in school, but the reality is um, things have changed dramatically even, even you know, 40, 50 years ago when, when I was in school and some of you were in school. Um, so that's my you know, presentation to you tonight. I know you have lots of questions, you want to have dialogue, but that's kind of the 60,000 foot view, so to speak, of where we're at uh, in the district. Maggie, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that uh, or any other board members. No, I think, I, th I think that's a lot to digest. At first, I think we can kind of start the discussion. There's a lot of information, it's just, you know, Going to my seventh and eighth year, this is um, the most uh, devastating that we could be able to survive of sustainability. So, just working towards solutions and you know working what what can happen and um, just ready to hear people's thoughts. Yeah. Thanks, Maggie. I think for the benefit of just, again, good background, uh, it would be valuable to have a city manager or deputy city manager just kind of, again, articulate, particularly for those that are not in our seats, to understand uh, how the tax cap works, how we formulate it. Uh, the superintendent spoke about the fact that we could not take into account new assessed valuation this year, a little bit on that. And I think also helpful for the conversation, I did ask the city manager earlier today, um, just in terms of for every 10 cent increase on the tax rate, how much more money can we spend? It's just a, it's a good barometer for the conversation. So I, I guess Scott's gonna take it, thank you. Sure, um, quick answer on that. 11,500 uh, would impact the tax rate by 10 cents. Every 11,000, uh, excuse me, every $115,000 would by 10 cents. Um, the tax cap, so Keep in mind what the tax cap is, is it limits the amount of property taxes that the community can raise each year to support the budget. Uh, property taxes are basically just your budget less your, rev your non-tax revenues, and then you need those property taxes to balance the budget. Um, I think everybody's aware, but there's four components to the tax rate. There's the city portion, there's the school local portion, the school state portion, and the county portion, all subject to this tax cap. And what we do is we take the prior year's amount of property taxes that were raised, uh, which last year was approximately $33.5 million, and you multiply that by the CPIU. We use the year-over-year -year CPIU, so we're using what it was at the end of 2023 and applying it to this budget. Um, that came in at 4.12%. And so that means when you do that, math, that uh, arithmetic, the total amount that the city can raise the property tax is by $1,382,000. Um, and the way that gets divvied up, w this was set in motion when the tax cap was first enacted, and city council took action to give some direction on how we were gonna compute this, because it's really just a tax cap on the total amount of property taxes that can be raised. So what was determined initially in order to try to um, come up with some semblance of continuity and how we develop it. Um, the city council decided that the school would be responsible for the school local portion and the school state portion, and the city would be responsible for the city portion and for the county portion. So any impact on the county portion right now has a bearing on the city's portion of the budget. We have to either absorb it, or if they're under the tax cap, it provides additional room for the city side of the budget. So, for example, on this county side right now, based on the estimate, they're over our tax cap by approximately $2,500. So we have to account for that on the city side as we go through that. Um, so basically, right now, as the way that's divvied up this $1,382,000, the city's budget can go up 420, school local 750, school state by 85,000, and the county by 125,000. And that's kind of how we divvy it up. The difference this year is this net construction value that's been something that has been discussed a little bit. Is under the limitation, there's two, two limitations there. There's 7.41B and 7.41C. 7.41C is the budget limitation with annual, annual changes in assessment. So that's just our typical year over year changes due to new, con new construction, whatever that would be. And 
under that section, you can raise your the real estate taxes raised from the prior year by a factor no more than the change in the National Consumer Price Index urban, and then also by applying um, the prior year real estate tax rate to the net increase in new construction. And that's defined as new increase in new construction is defined as the total dollar value of building permits less the total dollar value of demolition permits issued for the period of April 1 through March 31 of the preceding budget adoption. And what that means is basically if, if I come to the city hall and I file a building permit to build a house and the estimated value of that house is 500000 we would include that 500000 and multiply it by the prior year's tax rate and get additional room under the tax cap. If there's demolition, it would reduce that 500000 Unfortunately, under 7.4.1b, the budget limitation in a revaluation year, which we happen to be in a revaluation year, um, the real estate taxes raised from the prior budget year shall be increased by a factor no more than the change in the National Consumer Price Index urban, et cetera, period. And that's where it stops. So that's why this year we're just using the National CPIU. Um, so that's how it's been presented. So that's kind of how it gets calculated. And then at the end of the day, you're just taking what your estimated property taxes are for each component of the budget and matching it up to what your total amount you can raise. And the delta is whether you're over the tax cap or under the tax cap. A question that I have of Scott and then the superintendent, then I'll pass the mic. Um, Scott, if, if I could, uh, a question about the uh, building valuation, whether you build new or demolish, guessing that typically we build much more new than we demolish. Um, if we were able to include that, and I understand because of the restriction we cannot, but if we were able to include that, any sense of what that would be? Is it tens of thousands or is it hundreds of thousands? I mean, what's our experience been there? Well, recently it's been hundreds of thousands. I wish I had my last year's with me because um, obviously there's been a big building boom um, the past few years. So that's created a, a lot of room under the tax cap for us in the prior years um, that we're not seeing this year. Um, so it, it would be substantial. And a question for the, the superintendent. Uh, when you talk about uh, already committed uh, monies because of contractual obligations or things like lights and fuel, is that the 400000 that you were referring to or is that something different? So the 447000 that I was talking about, um, that would not cover the, well, for example, the teachers' collective bargaining agreement, their raises for next year. So what you're allowed to spend doesn't even cover those contractual obligations. Correct. Correct. A couple of follow-up questions for Scott. Um, don't, uh, and apologies uh, if I, this is obvious, but uh, why is new construction not allowed in a revaluation year? Is that state or is that just the way our charter is written? That's the way the charter is written. But there's no reason that that couldn't be changed. That's just the reason that's the way it was set up. Yeah, that's what was adopted. So the charter can always be changed. I, I know some of the cities have, have amended their tax cap process, their tax cap of the way it's written. Yep. And and. Is it a fair assessment to say, I mean, obviously there's always budgeting challenges, but the the severity of the budget shortfall this year is more or less a one-year issue because we can't count new construction and that sort of a more normal gap might exist in following years? I think it's, I, I don't know that that's the case because we've had other years where we've been through revals before where the CPI was much lower. Um, so we have had, we've probably had more restrictive years. Um, the issue with a reval is we're required to do one every five years. Um, you may be required to do it sooner depending on how your ratios are, but it's going to be at least every five years that we'll be confronted with dealing with this and having to do a, a citywide revaluation. And I guess to follow up for those which are more senior in the public uh, process here than I, is this something that happens pretty much every reevaluation year? Is this conversation? Okay, just by way of uh, way of construct, and then uh, just a quick follow up on on um, the shortfall. So the the roughly four hundred thousand dollars shortfall is the bare minimum 
shortfall under the tax cap. No, that's the, the, when you just tell, this is inconvenient. Yeah, yeah. I know, yeah. I understand. <laughs> so that, that 447000 is real cash that you can spend, expend on public education. It's real money that you can apply towards your, your operations. And so what I'm saying is that amount is not going to cover the needs that we have. Uh, it, it won't even cover salaries. So that's why we're looking at some pretty massive cuts. We're looking at laying off some people. We're looking at program cuts. We're looking at educational program cuts. Um, and so that, and, and that's basically what, you know, we decided as a group to bring forward. Uh, I know, Katie, I don't know if you want to mention uh, the tier system, just to give some examples of what we're looking at in terms Oh, you have a handout. Oh, it's good. Great. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm going to pet you. need the mic. Oh, oh. Thank you. Uh, and this, so this is uh, towards the superintendent uh, questioning. Um, I, I know you just mentioned I want to be repetitive, but... Um, what is the number for the salaries? I mean, I'd like to see a number for the salaries if you had it. Oh, okay, if it's coming. It's right here. And then maybe, um, and maybe you have it right here. Um, maybe we could have a number for the absolute bottom, meaning the, uh, the salaries, and then sometimes we have increases in insurance and so forth. Uh, maybe that could be on your radar uh, for the next time. And I. Oh, there is on the is it? Thank you, thank you for taking my question. I think I'll give the mic to Katie, and she can kind of walk us through this. Is it okay if I just sit back here? Okay. All right. I'm not going to go through a lot of it's already been said, but the top sheet is just a summary. So the top section is our expenditures. So as Lou mentioned, um, the proposed or recommended budget, reg uh, not regarding the tax cap. Um, so the top section, our proposal is coming in at one point, just over $1.7 million increase on our expenditure side. The middle section is our revenues. As the superintendent mentioned, we're um, having a loss of revenue of the 388. So in total, our net budget increase is uh, just $2.1 million. So allowable under the tax cap is at 836,000. So we're $1.2 million above the tax cap in our proposed budget. The next sheet, I won't go over in detail. That's just each revenue line item and where you see the increases and decreases. So I'm not gonna spend much time there, but you have that for your reference. Page three starts our expenditures. So this is where I've outlined um, where our increases are in the budget. So I've done it by negotiated contract and other contractual obligations. So the first one is our custodial contract. As you can see there, they, this is already a negotiated agreement that was negotiated you know, a few years ago. They had a 3.5% salary increase built in. They have benefit rate increases. Um, so their total negotiated contract is an increase of 47,806. Our SACA contract is in the process of being negotiated, so that's gonna be coming forward to council in the next few weeks. Um, so that, that's an estimate, uh, an estimate there for that contract because it hasn't been finalized, but the total there with salary increases and step increases and our health rate and dental rate increases is uh, just over 372,000. Then our teacher negotiated contract is next. You can see there they had a built-in 4.5% increase. Again, this was negotiated a few years ago. Um, so you can see their salary increases. There's medical buyback increases. Appendix C, which is our stipends for our co-curricular and athletics, which is built into the back of the teacher contract. And their health rate increases. Um, I believe you asked what the health rate increase was. It was 4.9 for our custodians and 4.1 for everybody else. Um, the reason they're different is because uh, the custodians went to school care prior to everybody else, and then when everybody else jumped over, we're rated differently, which is pretty low increase compared to what we've seen. We were seeing like in the 7 to 10 range the last few years, so that was a good, not a bad increase for this year. Um, the next section is the administrator contracts. Um, they're non-union, so these aren't negotiated, um, but there's some salary and benefit increases there as well. Um, we did add a couple of new positions into, this into our proposed budget. Um, 
we had an extra preschool program that we had paid for by our ESSER grant for COVID, you know, our COVID relief funds. Those are expiring in September, so we've built in, we need to keep the second preschool due to, to, to need and referrals for our special education students. So the teacher and the para that were budgeted in ESSER, we've moved into the district budget. And then the grounds maintenance position, I'm sure you remember we had built that into our budget for the current year, but it got removed during the budget reduction process last year. So um, our facilities director was asking to put that back into the budget. And then we've um, added two school to home coordinators and reduced our truant officer. Um, this year our truant officer left, we haven't filled the position. Um, so this would be reworking that position to be more of a positive and working with families to help them with their attendance issues. And that would be for two positions. On page four, it's continuing um, special education. Um, we This year we got hit with quite a few move-ins of students and so we've had to add additional para staff to our buildings. So I had to budget for them going into next year. So there was an increase for those staff. Um, we were able to reduce in our out of district and contracted services lines, but our transportation has also gone up significantly by 231,000. So special ed in total was an increase of about 126,000. And then the bottom section are just other budget changes. Again, most of these are all contractual obligations. Um, you'll see our first student transportation contracts increases for both regular eds and our CTC transportation contract. The SAU budget increased by 191,000. Um, we added in an additional special ed director. We had removed that from the budget and had two coordinators and we're asking to add that back in. Um, our Primex, small $282 increase between property and liability and workers comp. Um, the buildings, when we asked them to come forward with their budgets, we didn't give them a parameter. We didn't say come in at flat. We came in and said come in at what you need. So combined for all of the buildings, they had miscellaneous supply, print media, different increases of 39,960 for all buildings. Jay went through his facilities budget and he's coming in with an increase of 20,822. The school resource officer increase, that's 75% of the cost that the school district picks up for the school resource officer, so that was a $10,000 increase. Yes, it's contracted, yep. Um, copier usage, I increased that, that based on actuals. It's what we're actually spending in our budget, so I adjusted that. Um, we had some staff changes, so I, there's some salary and benefit changes there. The middle school and uh, high school athletics increased. Um, the middle school, we just are re revamping that um, program. So Steve uh, uh, Hodston, our athletic director, is now the athletic director over both the middle school and high school. So he's trying to increase the offerings that are done at the middle school level. So he's increased the budget based on those additional offerings. And then the high school increase is due to um, having to now pay for our athletic trainer. We've had that free from, from Wentworth Douglas for many, many, many years. And now we've been told that we're going to have to pay for that going forward. So the original proposal was about 25000 that they asked to add to our budget for next year. And then there was going to be an increase each year after. Um, Steve and I met with them. And they, they understand the hardships that schools are having. So they've de decreased that to twelve five, cut it in half. And then there'll be a sliding scale for the next three years to kind of bring it back up to where they want to be paid in full. Um, retiree health insurance, so in the teacher's contract, when you retire, you're able to stay on our insurance until you're age 65, and so that's the increases for those uh, retirees. We increased our technology software for antivirus software. It's just bringing it up to the number of machines that we have to cover in the district. And then there's some reductions here. Um, the debt service went down by 12,000. Our copier lease, we just redid it last year, so we had some savings there. Um, the supplemental appropriation that you approved for us for this year, I was able to release some of that money because they were one-time expenditures that we won't have going into the, the budget process for next year. And then, um, that we have three teachers that are retiring this year, so every year when we build our budget, we build it based on a master's step seven, like middle of the road um, salary and a two-person uh, two health plan um, when people retire for their replacement, so there's an adjustment there. So as you can see, our total proposed increase was the 1.7, as I mentioned. Then the last page goes over um, our reductions in order to meet the tax cap, or as the superintendent mentioned, the tax cap budget. So we did it in three tiers. So tier one would be items we felt we could remove with the least amount of impact. So um, we're going to zero fund the tech computer hardware line and just not buy any new tech computer equipment for next year. 
We took all of the, the $40,000 that I mentioned that the buildings came in with for their increases and we level funded them for next year so they won't get any increases in supplies or print media. We took out the late bus. Again, this is another item that we flip-flop every year. We, we cut it out of the budget, then we ask for it back in the supplemental appropriation while well, we're cutting it back out again because it's just a cut that we can make that we don't have to provide. Um, we reduced a 0.5 Maplewood building aid, a middle school case manager, and the grounds position. Again, we took it back out. <laughs> Tier two reductions are reductions that um, will have an impact um, more significant than the first tier. We may have to look at other ways of providing the service or providing the program, but we, we you know, in order to meet the tax cap, this is what we went with. So um, the SYC program will be removed. Um, it's a net of 100,000 because as I'm sure you remember, we have a budget of 290. We have revenue that comes in also to supplement the program of 190. So that would also be removed, the 50,000 contribution from the city, as well as the $140,000 that the parents pay for the program. I, I did want to say something here for health care. Just while we're at that topic, um, Katie and I and some others are going to be meeting with the Y to see the YMCA out of Rochester to see uh, if we can bring something in, if that is cut, uh, to accommodate those parents that use that existing service. I just want to me mention that because I'm sure there's, there may be some parents watching tonight. Um, the assistant superintendent position, that's it within the SAU budget, that's um, tier two reduction. Uh, the part-time foreign language position, this was another one that um, flip-flops occasionally in the budget process. Um, a reduction of two special ed paras, one at Maplewood and one at Idlehurst. These would not be one-on-ones that we have to cover by an IEP. These were more classroom-type paras helping with multiple students. And then a part-time custodian. So that's the Tier 2. Tier 3 are reductions that are, are going to have a significant impact on our district. Um, and we're, on, we're only recommending them in order to meet the number. That's basically uh, it. So we would reduce a CTC program. And again, we haven't finalized what the program is yet. And until we do, we can't really, it, it's, it's, with personnel, it makes it difficult because we don't want to say the person and we want to keep it a position because there's a lot of things that happen when you're cutting a position. You have to look at seniority, you have to look at bumping rights, you have to look at certification. So right now it's just a program. We don't know yet which that will be. Uh, a high school program, a library position between the middle school and high school. So we would reduce one of them and they would share one between the middle school and the high school. Uh, another building aid at Maplewood the two school to home coordinators that I mentioned that we were adding to the budget, those would be removed, and a middle school classroom teacher. Um, what's really difficult is that the biggest, and you all know this, the largest percentage of the budget is personnel. And so if you're going to make dramatic cuts, it's, it's going to come from personnel. You know, level funding uh, supplies, um, it only gets you so far. You know, you're not talking a lot of money there. So what, what the principals have control on is very minimal, very minimal. It's field trips, consumables, textbooks, classroom supplies. The rest of it really is, you know, focus on personnel costs. So thank you to several members that tried to give me the handout. It's, it's sort of the same song that we've heard over and over again. I'm not dismissive of the detail. Uh, but I am uh, important to remind uh, counselors that uh, we have uh, control over the bottom line, not the details of your spending. But I think the details are important. And sadly, the conversation about what stays and what goes really hasn't changed a whole lot in a number of years. You know, I was looking through my phone and I found a picture from 2012 where I vehemently opposed the tax cap uh, that, that, that obviously went down in flames uh, at the time. Uh, but we, we've had this in place now, it, I couldn't believe it, for more than 10 years. And uh, we have had some years where it's been less impactful than others. Uh, this is shaping up to be a very impactful year, and if my memory serves me correctly, probably our most impactful yet. Not only because of uh, the fact that we can't use our uh, additional valuation uh, that we have here, but it's coupled with the reduction in state aid. And let's not lose sight of this. This is 
perhaps less of a spending problem. Maybe it isn't a spending problem whatsoever, but it's the state of New Hampshire failing to meet their obligation year after year after year. If we didn't have that, would there still be challenges with this budget because of the tax cap? Yes, but I don't think they would feel quite as heavy. So I think that's important. Another important piece, and then uh, I'll be done, I think. Uh, maybe that's a lie. I don't know. Um, in terms of the, the tax cap and the budget preparation, if we were to spend to what is allowable under the tax cap, what is the estimated tax rate increase if we were to spend up to the tax cap for both city, school, county, and state? I know that's a curveball that I didn't ask you earlier. Sorry. A rough estimate, Scott. Yeah. So uh, as the city manager prepares his budget, so he's yet to finalize the city side that gets submitted to us by March 15, I think is the date. Uh, the budget that gets presented, city, county, school, and state, is going to have an estimated tax rate impact on the property taxpayer here in the city. You know, typically it's around a dollar, dollar thirty, dollar forty, something like that. So we're at about a dollar twenty if we spend up to the tax cap, and then no, the whole thing, the whole, the whole, the whole thing. So right, so the tax cap is keeping that down a bit. We were about we're higher than that last year. So. Um, Point is, is that now if we spend another hundred and fifteen thousand, we're now a dollar thirty. Another hundred and fifteen thousand, we're a dollar forty. So with every, you know, hundred and fifteen thousand, we go up ten cents on the tax rate, right? So that's where this just becomes not only a factor of conversation around the tax cap and perhaps the need to override that, but now it becomes a conversation about affordability. Uh, for the residents, and that's more of an appetite in a feel than it is a charter requirement, right? And th that's where we, we go here. I don't believe this is a shell game. Uh, I believe in transparency around this issue. Uh, I am deeply concerned about where this budget may be headed. Uh, I'd likely have an appetite for an override. I'm one of nine, and as uh, you might know, it does require the supermajority, two-thirds, so it's six of nine counselors to override versus just a, a simple majority for passage of uh, the budget. Um, to what end? Again, it's that appetite, you know. Uh, the, the state revenue shortfall is a big deal. Uh, you know, that's probably to, to get to that, you're talking another 40 cents on the, the tax rate. That brings us to $1.60. That's a 40 cent override. And that's before we've even seen uh, the city manager's proposal. You know, what is he able to do on the city side? Are we able to maintain services there, right? So it's, it's a little early in the game to really discuss specifics. I hear the challenges. I appreciate the detail. Uh, I'm sensing that this might be a year where we have a conversation around an override. I think since 2012, we've done it twice, two times, uh, and I think I supported it both times, so uh, I sense that I might be heading there again. But I'll be done, lots of others to talk. Thank you. Uh, we missed you on Saturday at 8 o'clock. You weren't there this year. Um, so thank you guys so much for fitting us. And I know that your dance card is crazy full tonight. So thank you so much. Um, I think as we look at the budget going forward, the thing that is really difficult to swallow is this is the status quo. We're not asking for a new beautiful outdoor classroom. We're not asking for hiring like a million more teachers. We are asking for what we currently have to work with. Um, and we absolutely are needing some help from all of our counselors here today. The other thing that I thought was really interesting, and I might have been Todd um, at our workshop, I'm not sure, um, but it was brought up that we have different constituents. I don't hear from anyone, I don't think I ever have, I don't know if anyone on the school board has, about the tax rate. 
I never hear about it. Um, and I do hear about the schools and how we can do things better. And I would imagine that most of you counselors have heard numerous times from people about taxes and the tax rate. So I think that that's really important to remember that we all have different constituents or different voices of constituents. I mean, the same ones, but they voice different things to different people. Um, and that we're all in this together and we, I really look forward to working together to try and find the best solution so that everyone can walk away from the table feeling um, good. And I really value all of you being here tonight um, and kind of looking at what we're looking at. Um, and it, nobody likes this, so. Let's all be clear about that. <laughs> oh, no, I'm good. Okay. So I have a question for um, Finance Director Smith. I think I've asked you this before. Uh, what is the projected uh, revenue coming in from the state? Do we have that? And uh, <coughs> that would be Katie. Do you have that projected revenue? Yep. Okay, so you're saying that, uh, okay, so at the end of the day, this, like last year, the state gave us, I don't know, what was it, 2.9? For the additional. Okay, 1.9, right. It was 1.9. Right. So what is, what will we receive from the state, or is it going negative? Is that what you're saying? If we can stay close so I can, because I want to. So the way it works is they will give us an estimate by September 15th of this year to build our budget. Then next year, they give us the finalized amount based on our year-end reporting. So in June, when we finalize our year-end reporting, we give them our free and reduced counts, our student enrollment, our average daily attendance of our students. Then they revise the estimate, and then they give us more money next year. But by then, we've already cut our budget. And the only things we can bring, bring back at that point are usually capital projects or one-time expenditures. So what is going to be that increase? That's, uh, that's what I'm not understanding. What, okay, so we are losing. Yes. Okay. And so just to, I know I'd asked um, the finance director, uh, Scott Smith, for um, uh, asked him about uh, questions that dealt with, um, didn't the state have to give us a number instead of a guest. I thought that went to court. Maybe you can't answer that question, but. Again, it's more a question for the school, but they do give us a number. The, the issue isn't that we don't get a number and get a final number. The issue is the timing of when we get that number. Right. So they give us an estimate. It, it's actually, it, it can be really frustrating because quite often, like what happened last year, they give an estimate that's quite a bit lower than what the actual came in that would have been useful during the budget development process and could turn down the heat sometimes on trying to develop that budget. So it makes it very difficult, I think, for all parties to plan. We, we have similar issues on the city side. It's just a much smaller number. So it doesn't impact the same way that it does on the school side. And thank you for that. Maybe this will go to the uh, superintendent. Um, so have you heard that I thought there was a court decision and I'm a state representative and I'll be finding out definitely this week. I thought there was a court decision that said that they mandatorily had to give you, but it could have been appealed. I'm not sure. Do you have anything on that? Oh, you're talking about adequacy. Yeah. Adequacy. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's, that's most likely going to work its way through the courts again. But in terms of how we budget, we're given the estimate and we have to go with the estimate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do want to say something about state funding because I, I agree with um, what you said earlier about state funding. You know, what frustrates me is the tax cap comes in at the $894,000 um, 894, roughly. But when you lose revenue, that's calculated into your overall tax cap. And so it's extremely frustrating when 1.9% of that total 4.1% is not allowed to be used on students. And so, you know, I keep going back to that because that's important to note that the lack of revenue really puts us in a bind. And I'll say another thing. Uh, I've been around for a long time and I've been around when I was in high school when special ed came out. It's never been fully funded. 
that's extremely difficult. And when I was on a local school board in a town, uh, when I was a younger man, um, we lobbied hard for increased funding in special ed. It still hasn't come to fruition. And the other thing that the state does, they have what was formerly known as catastrophic aid. We have a high percentage of students that are identified that are going out of districts. That's never been fully funded by the state. Uh, and so in some years, uh, the funding's 82% of what you're eligible for. In other years, it's 67% for what you're eligible for. So the reality is um, federal and state, which we pay, we pay federal taxes, um, doesn't come back to relieve the local taxpayers. And that's what is extremely frustrating for me. And I've seen it for many years. Since I was past the mic of frustration, I'll just continue on that, right? So, and then uh, money that we raise through taxation uh, can go to help uh, fund students that don't go to school here in Summersworth that choose a private alternative. So, the, and, then, and then the state will give you a little bit of money, which I would describe as feel-good money. Uh, but if you really know about it, it doesn't feel good at all. It feels like you're sticking toothpicks in my eye. Stop, right? Um, so for those watching at home, yes, I'm kind of slamming the state government because this is just a another year where we have a reduction uh, in state uh, funding. Uh, and giving us, to Councilor Vincent's point, uh, they uh, give us a perhaps artificially low uh, number, but you can't gamble with that, right? You're, you're forced into that corner. So uh, it, it makes it very, very difficult. And unfortunately, the feds can pass the cost to the state. The state can pass the cost to us, uh, but it stops here, right? We have one choice, either don't fund it, cut positions, cut programs, this, that, or the other thing, or we can pass it one more, and that's pass it to our property taxpayers. And therein lies the rub that makes me mad every year. I tell you every year that I hate the budget process. This is why, right? I would like to say a lot of bad words, but my mother might be watching, and she tells me not to. So um, anybody else for a whack at it? Uh, thank you. Um, this was incredibly helpful. Um, I just want to clarify a couple of things, and thank you for clarifying already. Um, so I'm looking at the 2.2 the increase that would be allowable, and then the 8.4 increase that's the recommended budget. And that's a really big range. But I think as it has been articulated, and I just want to restate it, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it's kind of arbitrary how we came up with that 2.2% number. Not only are we allowed to factor in the new construction um, because it's a reassessment year, we have this huge piece of the state, which thank you for bringing up, uh, Councillor Vincent, the, the court rulings, which one of my questions was going to be, does anyone know when the appeals are going to be over for that? Because that's going to massively, massively increase that line item from the state. The state is constitutionally um, mandated to provide an adequ adequate education. And what we're seeing here is we need to increase our budget by 1.2 million to even cover an adequate budget. And what percentage of that already is provided by the state? A very, very small amount. Um, so absolutely the state should be covering more. Um, and I just, I just want to say, as, as again, one counselor, I definitely have an appetite to override the tax cap. I definitely have an ap appetite to talk about whether or not we need to adjust the charter so that these arbitrary, in an evaluation year, we can't even factor in what we know we're going to be getting in as more funding. Um, and really heartbreaking that we have to even talk about all of these lists of people on paper that, that might um, get cut. So I hope that we can uh, fund the recommended budget. And also, just a thank you for approaching the admin and the staff and the teachers and asking them to give you a realistic budget and not a budget that would make everyone happy. Because I think what we all want to see is, what do you really need? And let's see if we can get there before we even start making those cuts. Question for Scott. I'm not trying to put you on the spot either, but you seem to know quite well the um, charter. There is an exception rule in the charter where you, in one in a year, you don't consider your principal and interest as well as capital expenses. But the way I look at that, wouldn't that just kick the can down the road if you exempted 
if you exempted the principal, like for example, the school districts has roughly 1.8 million in in our budget for um, principal and interest on capital projects. We also have um, for bonding, I should say. And then we have capital leases that I don't know, roughly. It's a, I think it's around what was that number? I I can pull it up, but yeah, 180,000. But so there, it, it it seems like there's an exemption. There's two options. I think you can go with an override vote or you can look at saying this year don't in your budget we we can with a two-thirds vote we don't look at your principal and interest and capital expenditures but then I wonder does this kick this down does this just kick the can down the road you know what I'm saying does that make sense sorta I, I'm not sure exactly what that means kick the can down the road um, well, we'll and, would we be back here next year with the, the same conversation? Yeah, 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 because you're always starting from square one. Right. You're always starting with the right. budget limitation. But I don't think you – I think what that does is it exempts your debt service. It's basically the change of your debt service. It, so it doesn't increase your ability to raise the tax cap by $1.8 million um, in addition to the 800000 what that does is it just says that portion of your budget that otherwise would be subject to the limitation is not subject to any limitation. Um, and to me, the, the main purpose of that, uh, with both capital but specifically debt service, is what it does is it gives the city council an opportunity to deal with essentially new debt. So say they issued a bond issue for a new school. Um, that would be a huge debt payment for the school, especially in year one. And I think what it does is it gives the council the opportunity to say, look, in this year, um, their debt service is going to go up by 500000 because they have this new debt, and it's basically going to eat up their entire cap. It's gonna, so this way, we're going to ignore that. That portion's not going to be subject to the tax cap limitation, but the rest of the budget is. So, so you would still be dealing with that 800 and some thousand dollars with everything outside your debt service and or your capital outlay. Um, and, then, and that just makes because they always have that ability then to just do a total override which is all bets are off. The budget's not subject to the limitation, and the tax rate, the tax amount, can go up as much as the city council is inclined to allow it to do. So, Anybody else that would like to speak on the issue at hand this evening? Again, we're very early in the process, right? The, uh, there are a number of public hearings, both on the school side and the city side, which will be coming uh, the public's way in the coming months. And uh, I know I think I can speak for the school board here. We value the public's input. Uh, please uh, come and speak about the budget, whether you support it or not. Uh, it's good to hear about that. Uh, again, most typically, nobody comes to speak about the budget, right? So there's very little guidance provided for uh, elected officials, and uh, I think we welcome uh, that guidance. Uh, again, the city manager will continue to, to develop the full budget. That includes the school budget bottom line. That gets delivered to the city council mid-March. We then will begin our deliberations on it. Uh, we need to act on it before uh, June 30. Otherwise, the city manager's budget becomes the default budget. I don't know that's ever happened here. Uh, despite maybe Mr. Belmore's <laughs> desire. <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, you know, typically we'll, we'll address that in uh, fairly short order once it's in our hands. Um, I know that uh, it's a desire of many counselors to try to um, deal with the budget as quickly as possible, particularly where there's uncertainty in terms of staffing and those sorts of things. It's not good to keep people on edge, so I think addressing it sooner rather than later is important. So. We're at about five minutes to six. We said we were going to six, unless there's another question or comment. We'll conclude this. Oh, we got one more. So, um, very quickly, I just wanted to say thank you for this conversation. I wish um, the people at home could see how we all started. Like, we started talking and laughing and chatting with each other, and I think that's amazing for us to come together. Um, no one likes budget season. Like, this... I can tell you I've lost sleep about thinking about kids going without programs and us losing, you know, programs for our students. It's gut-wrenching. But I appreciate this conversation. I appreciate all of you all coming out. And I'm excited to see where we're going to go with this. Very briefly, and I mean that. Um, 
the Dave Witham of school board, I guess. Um, <laughs> I know, I know, I, I'm aware. Uh, yeah, it's okay. I think, just to piggyback on that, I think, I think it's noteworthy um, that we are meeting like this. And it's not the norm throughout the state for both bodies to meet like this and to seek to understand each other. And I think that's what the people of Summersworth both um, expect and they deserve. And I'm confident that I recognize that school board has a very important role, so does the city council. But the city council has a broader role. And we recognize that. It's education, but it's not just education. It's, it's public safety. It's the infrastructure. It's recreation. It's others, water, sewer. So we recognize that. But I'm confident that we can come to a common ground, however, albeit imperfect. And uh, I appreciate the thoughts of uh, the potential override and, and the thoughts regarding the ch city charter. I was not for that either, by the way. My thought process was that I can affect the budget by, by the next, by, by the, via the election, right? But we are living with it right now. So I appreciate everyone here. And we were elected by many of the same people right, but with perhaps some different angles, different thoughts, school board, city council. So I did say I would be brief. I'm done. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. We will stand in adjournment until we meet again. So thanks, everyone. Thank